All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So thank you guys for joining. My name is Mark Lamonica. I'm the product manager for Morningstar Premium and morningstar.com.au. And today we're gonna to talk about how to select investments, which is exciting. So I managed to set up the camera by myself, um, which I guess is some sort of an accomplishment. So I know Will's on here. I guess, Will, you are replaceable, right? If I can actually figure out how to do this. But, uh, but anyway, let's get into this. So first, a couple of housekeeping items. Anything you hear today is general advice. Obviously can't offer you any personal advice because I don't know anything about you. If you are over in New Zealand, all the views in this presentation are morning stars and not of any individuals like me. And if you do want to read the FAP disclosure statements available on our website at morningstar.com.au. And if you want advice tailored to your personal situation, you should go speak to a financial advisor. The other, uh, the other thing is obviously I would love questions. So if you have any questions, please ask them, makes it more exciting for me. And as I always say, this is all about me. All right, so we're gonna talk about how to select investment. So a little bit of a reminder of where we've, uh, where we've gone with this. So earlier, and you can go see the recording on YouTube, we did a how to create a goals-based portfolio. And we went through those first two steps. So if we think about holistically what it takes to create a portfolio, we need to, of course, have goals. What are we trying to accomplish with our investments? Once we have some details and specifics around, uh, around goals, we can then, of course, create a required rate of return. So that is how are we getting from where we are now to the goal. Then, of course, we move into what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about asset allocation. So that asset allocation, of course, is informed by the required rate of return. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about selecting investments. Now, I like to keep showing this thing and keep talking about this process because many times, um, many times people, of course, skip to the end. So everyone's very excited about the investments. What ETF or share or fund am I going to invest in? And that's exciting, right? That's what you get to talk about with your mates at the barbecue. Nobody wants to hear about your asset allocation and nobody wants to hear about your goals. But it's really important to go through that whole process because it all builds on each other. And that's kind of the point we're going to try to uh, try to get through today. All right, so let's uh, let's get into this and talk a little bit about asset allocation. So asset allocation is, of course, how do you distribute your investments between different asset classes? And at a very high level, that can be growth assets and defensive assets. So growth assets are things like shares and listed property. Defensive assets are things like fixed interest and cash. And basically what you're trading off between these two different groups of assets is you are trading higher expected return for higher risk as measured in volatility. So what that simply means is, in plain English, is that if you invest in shares, you should get over the long term a higher expected rate of return. So you should get higher returns. But what you're giving up for those higher returns is the fact that the value of those shares is going to bounce around a lot. And that can cause very bad things depending upon where you are in uh, in sort of the life cycle of your investing. But also remember that volatility, particularly if you have a long time to go until your goal, should not bother you in any way. Now we know in reality it does, and we know that that it causes people to make poor decisions. Um, So both at the top of the market when people invest even more in equities, then of course at the bottom of the market when it's going down, people sell. So basically, people are doing things at the wrong time. But remember, volatility over if you have a long time to your goal should not bother you because what matters is the destination and not how you get there. So sort of the opposite advice you get from everything else in life. You're supposed to care about the journey. Um, And the reason, I'll go back a slide, the reason we want to go through this process once again and look at and measure this required rate of return is because it's going to make you make better decisions with asset allocation. All right, so we've got a couple portfolios on here. And so these are portfolios that are on Morningstar Premium. So we've got five different from conservative all the way out to aggressive. And what we have on here is a couple different things. We have timeframes. Um, So those time frames, once again, account for that volatility. So the longer time frame you have investing, the more you can invest in growth assets because that volatility is something that you can handle. 
If you have shorter term time frames back on this conservative side, then you can generally handle less volatility. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why. So I put all these things down. We've got the time frame. Then we've got roughly um, the, uh, the return expectations in these different portfolios. We've got um, then the split between growth and defensive assets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that other breakdown. So the reason you want to use a required rate of return is because this, of course, informs your asset allocation decision. So what that means is that if you need a higher required rate of return to achieve your goal, then you need to invest in assets that have higher expected returns, namely equities. If you have lower required rate of returns, then you can be more conservative. Now, the reason why this is important is a couple different reasons. Number one is it allows you to determine if your goal is actually achievable. So if you're coming up with some crazy rate of return, if you need 20% for the next 20 years, you're not going to make your goal. And what that allows you to do is temper some of your expectations or change around some of the inputs into the goal. So what do you need? Well, you need to save more potentially. You need to have a longer time period before you want to achieve your goal. So that's one really important reason why we looked at the required rate of return. The other reason that we look at the required rate of return is to make sure you are taking on enough risk to achieve your goals. See, traditionally, the way that the financial services industry, and this is, I don't know, people I work with, namely Shawnee, describe me ranting about stuff. Traditionally, the way that the financial services industry, and still the way that a lot of people do this, is they will take something called a risk tolerance questionnaire, where they will measure your reaction to volatility. So these things are, I mean, pretty simplistic at the end of the day. So they'll sit there and say, what would you do if the market went down 20%? Would you do nothing? Would you invest more, realizing that there are you know, cheaper valuation levels and more opportunity going forward? Would you sell everything and hide under your bed? And you basically go through this risk tolerance questionnaire, and that informs the asset allocation that they put you into. The problem is this whole process is agnostic to what you're actually trying to achieve. And what you're trying to achieve, of course, is to, uh, to reach your goal. And these things don't work, number one, because people cannot accurately predict how they will react in a stressful situation. That makes sense in every other part of our life. It also makes sense with investing. The other problem is, of course, when you do not take this goal-based view of the risk that you need to take on, you are making that decision in a vacuum. And you know, there's a lot of studies that come out and talk about how, number one, these things don't work, and then particularly how it impacts different people. So there are huge gender imbalances. Um, so the financial services industry does a really poor job um, generally servicing female clients, um, particularly around some of this risk stuff. So basically, women generally will answer in this risk tolerance questionnaire more conservatively. And because you're not looking at goals, it means it's harder to actually achieve your goals. Then, of course, the other problem is the other bias that's involved is most financial advisors actually put women in more conservative portfolios, even if they answer the same way in a risk tolerance questionnaire. But framing this around your goals allows you to sit there and have a real conversation with yourself or your client, if you're a financial advisor, and talk about, okay, you may be very worried about volatility, but if you don't invest in equities, you're never going to retire the way you want to. So you get to make those trade-offs. So once you've calculated that required rate of return, then you can look at the different portfolios. Um, and obviously, this is only one uh, set of them that, that we have here at Morningstar. And you can make some decisions around asset allocation. So that's a really important first step. And asset allocation, there have been studies that have indicated that asset allocation can um, influence 90% of the overall return that you receive. Um, so at a high level, that's certainly true. If we think about the trade-offs we're making between growth assets and defensive assets. And then, of course, there's other ways you can, um, and we'll get into some more specifics, about how you think about distributing your money across those growth assets or defensive assets. All right, we've got a couple of questions. So we'll get to a couple of questions in the beginning. Um, Okay, so first question, um, and then we'll move on to the rest. So <laughs> question, I wonder how many people attend your interesting, helpful Zoom meetings? Well, that's very nice. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, we have, we have varying crowds, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we've been doing these for, I don't know, 14, 15 months. We've had a lot of people, I don't know, Shawnee keeps track of it, but, uh, but yeah. Not a lot of people, but thank you for thank you for complimenting these. So Roddy's asking, it's getting more difficult to compare these balanced 
and growth um, portfolios these days, um, he knows that there's quite a variation in actual growth versus defensive asset alloc allocations across many funds, super funds, multi-asset ETFs, some super fund portfolios called balanced, um, anywhere between 50-50 to over 70-30. Okay, so let me, uh, it's a really, really good point. So one of the problems is, that you know, there is, of course, no um, regulation or even probably best practice around what constitutes a portfolio that's described, for instance, as balanced. So it's very important that you look at the details. And as Rodney pointed out, you could go to one super fund where their balanced portfolio is a growth portfolio and all the other super funds. Um, so it's really, really important to look at what those underlying assets are. So naturally, we, of course, just gravitate to the word. So like I would never invest in a balanced fund because I'm not balanced. That's what people tell me. But naturally, people just sort of gravitate to uh, gravitate to what those words are, but you have to look at what those underlying asset allocations. So remember that we're talking about basically just a risk spectrum. Further out you get on the risk spectrum in terms of volatility is, uh, is more growth assets. And then of course, more conservative investments are more defensive assets, but it's a really good question. Um, so David, who, did point out that he accidentally put caps lock on, but it looks like he's yelling at me here. Said my goal is to receive a 6.5% annual return. Does that always mean I need an aggressive portfolio? Um, listen, yeah, 6.5%. We have, we have obviously been blessed with um, very, very strong returns. I think, uh, I think we do need to be cognizant of the fact that what has happened since the GFC historically is not normal. Um, so returns have been a lot higher than they, uh, than they have been historically. Um, so I think that's an important thing to take into account. The other thing that I take into account um, is, uh, well, two things. Number one, if we look back overall on historic returns, if we go back to like 1900, those returns may potentially be inflated as well because inflation was higher. And I think the problem is people go back and they look at returns and they don't think about what are the real returns. Um, so what are the actual returns you're taking into account according if you include inflation? Um, so those returns, those real returns are probably inflated um, the way that people look at them. Now, and I think that matters, of course, is what happens in the future um, at the valuation levels that we're at right now. Yeah, the question is, what kind of returns are we going to get in the future? Because remember, those valuation levels matter. So if you think about... Um, <laughs> See, I, I make these statements about Will not being here. Um, but anyway, sorry. The last part of this, of course, is if you go back and look at equities, for example, think about the three places you can get returns if you're a share investor. So the one place you get a return is dividends. Um, so if it, uh, income that you receive, dividends have traditionally made up something like 60% of overall returns. They are important. Dividend levels are at all-time lows. Um, so you're not going to get the same return from dividends as you traditionally did if stocks were cheaper. Second place you get equity returns is you get returns from changes in valuation levels. So basically, people are willing to pay more for earnings, cash flow, whatever we want to call it. Now, the problem with that is, is of course, is as interest rates have come down, those valuation levels have gone up a lot. So even if they don't go down from where we are, even if we're perfectly comfortable that they will stay the same, which is close to historic highs, are you gonna get that bump from increased valuation levels? Probably not, right? You would still have to have those go higher and we need to think about if that's actually possible given where interest rates are. And then the last place you get returns from, of course, is growth. Um, so the growth of the underlying companies. So if somebody's willing to pay 10 times earnings, that's great. If you grow earnings 20% a year forever, well, you're going to do pretty well, right? Because they're still going to pay 10 times those earnings. So we don't need changes in valuation. What we need is just growth from the company. Um, and yeah, you know, I think that's where we have to assess sort of where we are. Growth has generally slowed down um, in developed markets. Um, we have to think about, okay, and that's overall GDP growth. There's obviously winners and losers with different companies. So the question is, yeah, where are we going to get that growth? Um, on out, apparently. If someone could message me if the video has gone back on.
It hasn't. Okay, I'm gonna try to. All right, well, if this doesn't work, I don't know how to fix it, but hopefully everyone can still see the screen and I guess hear me, uh, but we'll see about that. Okay, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, so apparently you just can't see me, which should be a blessing um, and the audio is okay, but thank you guys for letting me know. Um, somebody asked if I'll share the PowerPoint. Yeah, just send me an email, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Um, oh, lots of people have said the video is not working. Somebody said I'm hiding. Okay, well, sorry. After making fun of Will, I, uh, yeah, can't do that. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. I thought we had lots of questions, but, uh, but most of them are comments about how you can't see videos. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, about some of the details around asset allocation. So what I took is I just took a screenshot of something off of premium that shows the breakdown, um, the underlying breakdown in this aggressive portfolio. So once again, we do have on here, um, we do have 90% growth assets and 10% defensive assets. So the defensive assets are these, Australian fixed interest, international fixed interest cash. And then you can see the distribution between equities, both domestic and international, listed property, global infrastructure. Those are your growth assets at the top. Now, the question for you, of course, as an investor is, okay, now that you've made an asset all allocation decision, now that you've made a decision that, okay, if I want 6.5% return, to use the example, I need to be in an aggressive portfolio. Now you have to start thinking about, okay, how am I actually going to invest? What are the securities that I go out there and actually pick? Uh, and before we get right into the security selection, there's some overriding questions, which we're going to try to answer today. So the first question is, are you going to invest in individual security? So an individual share, for example, or an individual bond? Or are you going to invest in a collective investment vehicle? So basically a fund or an ETF or a LIC, et cetera. Then we have to think about strategy. Are you going to employ an active or passive strategy? And then finally, and we're gonna cover most of this on Thursday, are you gonna focus on exchange traded products? So that's an ETF, for example, or a LIC, something that trades on an exchange, or a non-exchange traded product, which is a fund. This is kind of what we're gonna walk through today. So once again, hopefully everyone sees the connection of setting your goal, calculating your required rate of return, getting an asset allocation, uh, target, and then of course, moving into picking investments. And that's once again, investments are the last option or the last decision you need to make, even though a lot of people think it's fun. So what do you do? Well, if you're a professional investor, you would define what investments you're gonna take, what investments you're gonna select, the criteria you're gonna use to select them and why in something called an investment policy statement. Now, an investment policy statement, if you're a professional investor, and there are some regulatory um, reasons why you want to use one, um, are obviously going to be very long and complex. But this is something that's pretty good for individual investors as well. So, and I'm not very good at this because I'm horribly, I think I was described once as horribly disorganized. But, um, you know, writing stuff down is really important, especially when you're doing something that involves emotions, um, which investing does um, during certain times of the market. Writing down a plan is really, really effective. It keeps you grounded. Just the fact that before you do anything, you can go back and read that plan is really effective in terms of lowering the probability that you're going to do something stupid. Um, so, that's kind of why we like investment policy statements. At the end of the day, it can be very, very simple. And we'll sort of talk through this. We have those three different questions. It could be for my Aussie equity exposure, my target is this. I want it to be 40% of my portfolio. I want to invest in direct shares. Here's why, and here's the criteria I'm gonna to use to select direct shares. It can be very, very simple. Um, but yeah, it's a good idea sometimes to write stuff down. But let's go through this decision-making process. All right, let's look at this share versus ETF or fund um, question. And one really important thing to remember is, of course, you can do both. 
Um, so that's the caveat with all of this. But let's talk about investing in individual shares or individual bonds. Now, I don't spend a lot of time on individual bonds because it's very, very difficult for individuals unless you have a lot of money to go out there and purchase individual bonds. So most people use an ETF or fund. But so let's, let's particularly look at shares. All right. So what are the, some of the things you need to think about? You need to think about your investing edge. So what is an investing edge? It is just a, you know, somewhat ridiculous like investing term to describe what your advantage is. So we talk a lot about moats and competitive advantages for companies. It's also important to think about your own competitive advantage, particularly if you're going to go out there and buy shares. Now, this is something I do. Um, and I can sort of talk through where I think potentially my advantage falls. Um, but obviously, it's important to know that even professionals, um, we'll talk about some advantages you have over professionals in a second, but even professionals have a very, very difficult time beating indexes. Um, so you should, uh, you should spend some time thinking about if this is a good idea for you. And I'll talk about myself in a second. But let's look at the four main pieces of edge, investing edge. So remember, this is, remember, an index represents average. Okay, so the index represents the average of how investors do. So to beat an index, you need to do better than average. Now, you don't necessarily have to beat an index. Maybe your goal has nothing to do with beating an index, which we can talk about. But if you want to do better than average, you need to have an advantage, right? You know, it's like those surveys where they go out and they ask everybody if they're an above average driver. And like 85% of people think they're above average drivers, which obviously is not true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. There's four sources of edge. So the first edge is informational edge. So informational edge basically just refers to the fact that you have information about a particular investment that either nobody else has or is not widely known. Um, now, informational and informational advantage is very, very difficult to come by. So this certainly used to be um, a huge advantage back when, number one, there were not laws out there preventing insider trading. Um, and, you know, number two, when you didn't have the internet and you didn't have the ability to disseminate news um, and, um, and information as widely and instantaneously as you can do now. So what could be an informational edge? Well, you know, if you're back in the 1920s and you live in New York and you have a bunch of friends in the industry, then, yeah, you're going to have an edge over somebody that's out in San Francisco trying to invest. Right. So you're going to have a big edge there. A lot of this is insider information. There are a lot of regulations now that prevent that. There's a lot of regulations that require fair disclosure so that um, even if you are an analyst at a company like Morningstar, the chief executive of the company cannot just go tell you stuff about the company that is not shared with the public. So there's a lot to present to prevent informational edge. Um, there's some crazy stories about stuff that hedge funds do where they hire satellites to take pictures of retail parking lots to try to uh, figure out if they're going to have good sales that quarter. Um, but most likely, you're not going to have informational edge. And most likely, most people won't um, that are obviously doing things legally. All right, let's move on to analytical edge. So analytical edge assumes, of course, that the information that is out there is widely known and um, you know, disseminated to all investors. And then the question is, you need to go through an analysis. So you've got all this data and you've got all this information. So what? Um, so analytical edge is a couple different things. Number one, it is obviously just the ability to take something and figure out what's going to happen in the future um, and how good your predictive powers of the future are. Because as investors, of course, we are always investing for the future, which is, of course, unknowable. Um, the, other, uh, the other real thing about analytical hedge, especially nowadays, is there's so much noise and data coming out there. It is knowing what to ignore. Um, which I think is really, really important and something that, you know, our analysts, actually, wait a minute. I think I started the video again. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Um, but anyway, apologies that people have to see me now. Um, so our analysts particularly stress this all the time, um, that it's really, really important to know what information to actually listen to and what to ignore. 
Um, and we see this stuff all, all over message boards, everything else. And some piece of news comes out that is actually irrelevant um, to a company. Um, but people like to jump on it. So analytical edge could also be just knowing what to ignore and knowing what to pay attention to. And that's what our analysts try to do. Um, so both the way that they analyze things and, and try to estimate what's going to happen in the future. And then also, of course, understanding and really understanding the industry and understanding the companies and knowing, okay, this is something that matters. This is something that doesn't. All right. So those two are interesting. Um, you know, I think the biggest advantage and, you know, something that I hope that I have from an analytical standpoint is, of course, around ignoring the uh, ignoring things. Um, geez, we're not doing well. Now we're getting echoes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just keep going. This is just like, you know, a train wreck of a, uh, of a webinar with me turning off the camera and echoes. But let's talk about structural edge. So structural edge can be a huge advantage for you as an individual investor. So structural edge refers to the fact that many professional investors are faced with, they are investing within structures that, um, that prevent them from making good long-term decisions. Um, now, I know that sounds very strange, but let's think about what happens if you're a professional investor. If you're a professional investor, this is, of course, your job. You are very, very worried about compensation. Um, you're very worried about keeping your job, and you are going to do things in order to make your pay as high as possible and keep your job. So, what does that mean? Generally, what that means is people that a lot of professional investors are unable to resist the temptation to make very short term focused decisions. So short term focused decisions around basically chasing their peers and chasing performance. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a portfolio manager, it is probably better for you. It's definitely better for you from a career perspective to be wrong along with everyone else, than to go out on your own and make a very different decision. Um, so you see this right now, right? So you see everyone's holding the same shares. Uh, so everyone's investing in the same things because, yeah, you know, if Microsoft tanks and drags down a bunch of portfolio managers, at least they're all in it together. At least when they sit there with their boss, they can have a conversation and say, hey, everyone else thought Microsoft was great as well. I don't think there's anything wrong with my analysis. So you tend to get a lot of hurting uh, mentality there. Um, and even though they will all sit there and tell you, and they're educated enough and smart enough to understand that investing for the short term, following the crowd are both terrible ways to invest, there's still a lot of inducements to do that around career risk. The other thing, particularly if you're investing in funds, is simply the structure of a fund um, and the fact that oftentimes, as a portfolio manager, you are getting a bunch of money to invest when you don't necessarily have something that you want to invest in, and you have to sell a bunch of shares when the time is not right to invest in it. And that's our fault as individual investors. We chase performance. So what that means is huge inflows go into very strong performing funds. Most of those fund managers then have to invest those inflows. They, of course, can hold cash, but most of them won't. There are some that will, most won't, because once again, they do not want cash. They're trying to chase performance, which means they need to be fully invested. Um, conversely, when a fund is not doing well, everyone pulls their money out, which means that the portfolio managers have to sell things. So generally, that means that they are exasperating this behavior we see in investing, of investing at the top of the market and selling at the bottom of the market, because structurally, they are forced to do that, to invest new money coming in, Excuse me, and then meet, um, and then of course uh, be able to meet outflows. Um, so structural advantage is a huge advantage you have as an individual investor. It's hard to do it, but you can stay long term focused. You can keep focusing on your goals and try to not get caught up in this short term mania. We're all chasing each other in, around into whatever the hottest asset is. The last one, so I think structural edge is hopefully something I have. Um, behavioral. Behavioral is the last one, and it's related. So basically, behavioral um, refers to the fact that, you know, as humans, we're, we're hardwired to make poor investment decisions, um, right? So we are, this is the old Ben Graham uh, fear and greed um, thing. So we are driven by greed when we get to hear about 
once again, you go back to the barbecue, not that any of us in New South Wales are going to be at a barbecue in a while, but we, uh, we get to hear about um, how rich everyone's getting and the crazy speculative investments that they are, uh, that they're investing in. And we all sort of chase those around and think, oh, Everyone's getting rich, but me, I need to go out there and buy this. So we're driven by, by greed. We're also driven by fear, right? As we see our account balances going down and down and down, we want to stop that. We feel like we need to do something. We have an action bias. So what do we do? We sell. Because at the very least, temporarily, that stops that uh, that stops that account balance from going down. So behavioral is difficult, right? Because this is something that we're hardwired to do. But behavioral um, edge is something that is pretty easy for an individual investor to actually. No, it's not easy, but it is something that an individual investor can accomplish. Basically, if you understand what you're doing and put the right structures in place to try to prevent you from doing something dumb, and we'll all do dumb stuff. Every once in a while, I do dumb things 50 times a day. But, uh, but once you, uh, but hopefully over the long term, if most of the decisions you make are, uh, are good ones, then you can be a successful investor. All right. So we've got a couple questions, I think, or maybe just comments. Okay. Let's see what we have. Um, yeah, so Sally's asking if I can give an example of the growth asset is and what an example of a defensive asset is. I will do that in a second. Um, Okay, so Mark is asking a question. Would you consider infrastructure as defensive, toll roads, et cetera, COVID situation put to one side? Um, yeah, so what uh, infrastructure is an interesting one. Um, so infrastructure, of course, as Mark kind of alluded to in his question, refers to things like toll roads, airports, um, power plants, pipelines, et cetera. Now, generally, what happens with infrastructure um, is a company will take on a fair amount of debt. Um, so they can, of course, invest in an asset that over time will, uh, will of course, earn back a certain return. And that return is generally generally locked in in some way. Um, so obviously, if we use toll roads as an example, COVID is, you know, a uh, hopefully anomaly where we did see traffic patterns drop significantly um, because, of course, nobody was going to work or driving around. Um, but, uh, but generally, these assets do have pretty steady, and same thing with airports, obviously, but generally they do have pretty steady traffic um, and there's inflation escalators in there. But the reason I would consider infrastructure more of a growth asset compared to like fixed interest, for example, is because you're taking on all this leverage as a company, you are only doing it to earn a return. And this isn't a return on the security, a return on the investment that we would consider equity like. Um, but hopefully, and why people like it, hopefully less volatile. Um, so nobody's going in there. You know, if you sit there and look at, um, if you look at like a US Treasury um, bond right now, like a 10-year bond that's you know, yielding less than 2%, nobody's going to go build, to use a Sydney example, the West Connects for 2% a year return. They're going to build a much higher return into there. So yeah, we would still, from a return profile, we would still consider infrastructure to be growth. I will say that, you know, if there are other sort of tweaks you make to your portfolio, if you're looking for lower volatility, um, then infrastructure would generally fit the bill. So even as a growth asset, it would have less volatility um, than some extremely speculative like biotech stock. Um, so even within those categories of growth and defensive, we then need to think about, which we'll get to in a second, we need to think as investors, you know, what are the things I'm trying to achieve? So like personally, what I'm more comfortable with is I am more comfortable with um, lower volatility uh, in the equity portion of my portfolio. Um, so I gravitate generally to a certain kind of stock. I like stocks that are non-cyclical. Um, so basically stocks that do not vary widely based on where you are in the business cycle. I tend to look for things that pay dividends. I tend to look for things that have lower debt levels, all the different sort of high risk things that can be built into a stock where, yeah, maybe there's a higher expected return, but there's more volatility. So that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, so I think it's kind of about everybody thinking about what they're comfortable with and what their personal circumstances are. So of course, as you approach retirement or any sort of goal, you want to lower that volatility in your portfolio because the impact of a giant fall is pretty substantial on you. 
Um, so hopefully that answered um, the question. Okay. Um, yeah, so David, so we have a follow-up on infrastructure. He says, won't infrastructure stocks with a lot of debt tank when interest rates rises? Yeah, potentially. Um, so that is that is a big risk. So infrastructure, infrastructure, um, real estate investment trusts, all these companies that take on massive amounts of debt, um, obviously the risk goes up when interest rates rise. Now, there's a couple different things you need to think about here. Number one is obviously, you know, the structure of that debt. Um, is it fixed rate long-term debt um, that, is, uh, that is not going to have any sort of rate rise? Now, this will impact them funding new projects, but that's potentially one thing that can uh, that can de-risk them. The other thing is um, why are interest rates rising? So a lot of these infrastructure companies have built-in inflation escalators in their contracts. So if we want to use Transurban as an example, um, you know there are toll rises that they are allowed to do. This is all built into the original concession that the government gave them to build a road and then, of course, uh, manage that road for a set amount of time. A lot of them do have inflation escalators built in there, which can, if inflation is what's causing rising interest rates, that can protect them. So they obviously know that that is their big risk, that they are taking on a lot of leverage to do this. Um, okay, so got a question from Tom. Uh, assume portfolio is equity only. Do you have a view on what asset allocation would be within a lower risk equity only portfolio against a higher risk equity only portfolio? Um, the former ASX 200 only, small caps. Um, yeah, so let's talk about, um, we, do, we do not have, so Tom, we do not have like a set portfolio for that, but let's talk about some of the different factors. All right, so once again, when we are describing risk, we are describing risk as volatility. Um, so what is the variation of return? So let's look at a couple of different factors we can look at. That sentence did not come out right. Let's look at a couple of different factors. So if we want to talk about um, company size, uh, so large cap stocks, big companies versus small cap stocks. Small cap stocks have more volatility. Um, and why do they have more volatility? Because they're smaller companies, which generally means that um, the cash flows that they generate have more volatility, which means the share prices have more volatility. So if you're a smaller company, you're not established, um, you potentially do not have market share or a product that, uh, that has been generally and widely accepted by, uh, by the population. You potentially have more risk um, around things like leverage if you're, if you're more of a sort of smart up, startup small cap. Um, so you're going to see more volatility in small companies versus if we look at a giant company like Telstra, um, right? So Telstra's earnings are a lot more predictable than Avita Medical, right? That's making burn, um, that's making burn treatments that, you know, in some ways, some of them are still awaiting approval. Um, so if you want less volatility in your portfolio, and conversely, the assumption is lower returns, lower expected returns, then yeah, you probably gra gravitate towards the high, uh, to the big caps, big cap, large cap space. Um, if you're looking for potentially higher expected returns, you go into the small cap space. Now, anyone who was on the last webinar knows that when we go back and look at this FAMA and French three-factor model of what actually drives returns. So generally, it was value companies that are small cap stocks. Now, that has not happened. It's been big growth cap stocks since the GFC. But yes, you would expect less volatility in larger cap stocks. Simple ones, dividend paying stocks, generally you have less volatility um, because even if things are not going great for the company and the share price declines, people will hold on because they're collecting that dividend and there may be more income oriented investors. Um, so that's really a shareholder thing. You have shareholders who are less likely to all panic and sell um, if you have something like a dividend. And we can also measure volatility by looking at the beta of a stock. So we can see in certain industries, um, you can have lower beta stocks, meaning they will not move as much as the market. Um, so those are all different factors you can look at, Tom, if you're trying to um, come up with an equity-only portfolio. And one thing, if, if you do have access to our research, is look at the uncertainty level. Um, so we have an uncertainty level rating on every single one of the shares that we cover. And that uncertainty level is our analysts' uncertainty with the future cash flows they're going to generate. How certain are they? with um, 
these future projections. So this is the future, it is unknowable, but you're a little more certain of what's gonna happen with Coca-Cola, for example, than you are with some biotech startup that's trying to develop a treatment that may or may not be approved. Um, okay, so let's keep moving. We'll get to some of the other questions. All right, so let's talk about the next question. The next question you need to ask yourself is, are you gonna invest in shares if you have an edge? Potentially, you're going to invest in individual shares. Are you going to invest in collectively managed investments like an ETF or fund? And remember, there can be a mix. And remember, between each asset class, you can make a different decision. You could say, I think I have an edge in Aussie equity. I do not have an edge in emerging market equity. Um, so I'm going to use funds and ETFs and emerging market equity. But I'm going to pick some of my own shares for Aussie equity. The next decision you need to make, of course, is active versus passive. So once again, just a little bit of a definition. So passive, of course, means following an index. Now, because there are all these ridiculous indexes now, um, you have to kind of take passive uh, with a grain of salt. I have people sitting there telling me that they are in a passive ETF because they are following this ridiculous FANG ETF that has 10 securities in it where I've ranted about FANG enough, but be careful about what active versus passive. If you're following very narrow indexes or you're following some index that is this Frankenstein amalgamation of lots of strange stuff like these battery tech um, and resource indexes and all this stuff that's just been made up as a marketing ploy, then you're probably not a passive investor. But anyway, passive investing following a large index um, and diversified index. Um, active, of course, is for fund or ETF, is a manager or an algorithm. Somebody or something is making a decision upon what securities to put in there. Now, active versus passive, of course, is once again a... Um, a debate where people think that they have to be in one camp or the other, and of course you don't. So for different asset classes, different strategies may make sense. So let's talk about some of the things that you wanna consider when you're deciding between an active strategy and a passive strategy. Okay, so we'll start with uh, efficiency of the market. Now, what does efficiency of the market mean? A efficient market and there, of course, is the efficient market hypothesis. The efficient market hypothesis says an efficient market means that security prices reflect underlying value. So in English, that means that shares are going to trade very close to what their value is. Um, now, you know, of course, Morningstar and a lot of, uh, a lot of analysts do, uh, do sit there and spend time trying to calculate the value of the company that, uh, that, they're, that they're reviewing, and then they compare that to the market price. And it's the old Ben Graham adage that at certain times there can be big disconnects between the value, excuse me, the value of a company and the share price. So particularly at these sort of peaks and troughs of the market where Everyone's in like a speculative frenzy. Um, and then when everyone is, of course, running for the hills and selling everything, those are particularly those extreme points. There can be larger differences between, um, between the value and, uh, and the price. So when we talk about market efficiency, we are saying how much do we believe these individual markets reflect the underlying value of the companies? Now, of course, there is no way to measure this. It is all historic. You can look back and say, hey, in the year, you know, going into the year 2000 with the internet bubble, of course, that market was not efficient. It was way overpriced. And why was it way overpriced? Well, we proved it was way overpriced when the NASDAQ fell 80%. Now, it's very nice to look at that historically, but there's no way for us to measure the efficiency of a market at this point in time. So the way that we do it, and the way that we do it with Morningstar is we go and we look in our active passive barometer report, we go and we look and we say, okay, are active managers beating their passive indexes or not? The more that are able to, um, to beat those passive indexes, the higher percentage chance of somebody or historic uh, returns or they've been able to beat that passive index, the less efficient the market is. And less efficient markets where price and value do not coincide are places for active management. 
Now, the other way to think about this, of course, is how popular is the market? So if you're the S&P 500 in the U.S., if you're a large cap growth investor in the U.S., you are not alone. So there are tons of people investing in large cap growth in the U.S. So the fact that you have all these other people looking at um, a certain market generally means it's going to be more efficient. So you've got all these smart people. You've got all these computers. You have um, just, you know, worldwide attention on these large cap growth companies, you would expect, of course, that they would be less efficient because the market price, of course, of any security is the consensus of what everyone thinks about it. So in less efficient or in more obscure markets, it could certainly be less efficient. So what are examples of those? Emerging markets, fixed interest, which is giant market with all sorts of different weird corners you can go into. Um, things like that are generally less efficient, small cap, um, places where less investors are playing, either for structural reasons or just because there's less interest. Um, so that is why if you look at this active passive barometer report, you start seeing the areas where active management can add value. And it's basically what I was talking about, fixed interest, Merging markets, small cap, very specialized um, real estate, things like that that are less efficient could be a candidate for active management. Or if you're investing in the ASX 200, it's very hard for a manager to beat that. Fee hurdle, of course. So the problem, I said that passive represents the average, um, well, it costs money to invest in one of these vehicles. That means by definition, most people do below average because they're getting the average and they're taking a fee out of it. So even if you go to Vanguard and have very low fees and invest in an index, you're doing slightly worse than average. But that fee level matters. Um, so obviously fees are really important. It's important to look at fees. Um, how representative of the index, I'll go through these last two quickly. Um, so how representative of the index is, is how much does the index actually make up the investable universe? And this is particularly around fixed interest, where the index might be pretty narrow at the end of the day compared to all the different bonds out there. So debt markets are huge. There's a lot more um, debt than there is equities. Um, so these markets are huge. The index only represents a fraction of that. So that means there are opportunities for somebody to go out there and find um, and find good value. And then how liquid are the assets? So very simply, we're just talking about uh, how easy is it to buy and sell things? Now, this is a big problem with passive indexes in illiquid markets because the manager has to do, not just one manager, all the managers have to do the same thing. Um, that when some security gets removed from the index or another one gets put in the index, they all have to sell one and they all have to buy the other one. If it's very difficult for them to do that, if the market's a liquid, there aren't a lot of buyers and sellers out there, it means the price is gonna move more. And that's gonna impact you as an investor or it's gonna take longer for them to do it, which introduces tracking error to the portfolio. Um, so that how liquid are the assets is really important too. So these are the different considerations you want to, uh, and generally how liquid the assets are does correspond with the efficiency of the market and how representative the index is. So fixed interest is a perfect example where the assets are not liquid. Um, so it can be very hard for managers to reposition when indexes change. Active manager doesn't have to worry about that. Even if they wanna sell something, there's no mandate for them to try to sell that as fast as possible. They can wait a long time and slowly offload positions where you can't do that passive because you gotta match that index. Um, so all different considerations. All right. The last, uh, the last step you need to decide is, of course, are you looking at a fund, something that is traded? And we'll spend more time on Thursday talking about this. Um, a fund, something that is not on, uh, on an exchange versus an ETF and a lick, which is, off ex which is on the exchange. Apparently, I'm just getting confused now. All right. So you want to look at a number of different things, but these are really factors around you. Um, so ETFs are obviously hugely popular, and I do see people paying very high fees, um, trading fees for ETFs. So they're either doing that through some sort of platform. Um, so whether that's, uh, whether that's Raise or it's all these micro investing platforms um, where people are paying very high fees basically to alleviate trading fees. Um, and they're doing things that don't make any sense, um, right? So, you know, it's the people that are investing their first $2,000 and want this portfolio that's, um, 
you know, diversified across 20 different ETFs, and they're basically getting sold this bill of goods where, okay, we'll eliminate those fees. We're going to charge you 3% a month. Well, that's really, really bad. Um, so yeah, think about your own personal investing. If you are um, investing constantly, sort of paycheck to paycheck, and Shani's a big proponent of this, is looking at some of these fund um these, these direct investments into funds or funds off of a platform where you're able to make small, consistent, basically savings plans, small, consistent investments into a fund. And you're not paying um, the same transaction fees that you're paying for an ETF. Um, so we'll spend more time on Thursday talking about that. Um, so I don't want, to, uh, don't want to ruin that. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.